tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. I sat slowly circling the teaspoon around my black coffee, creating swirls of bubbles so perfect a combination had never occurred in existence, would never occur again, yet were the production of something so utterly banal no one would ever appreciate their complexity. This cup was a perfect microcosm of my surroundings. A motorway diner that was somewhere but nowhere. A place where people passed through but never visited. Lives imprinted here for a moment. Yet, like a name written in breath on a window, would never leave a mark on their surroundings. The diner was like an old, yellow, dog-eared photo of itself. Dirty blinds covered the windows, slicing the light from passing cars into searching shafts that crawled across the walls. The tables were shrink-wrapped in scarred, white, clean plastic that would require far more than a wipe to clean, and the floor was a disfigured chessboard of black and white parquet grimacing at me with cement cavities. This faded facsimile of Americana was supported by the reproduction 60s jukebox leaning lazily on the far wall, although Enya's Caribbean blue drifting from the speakers shattered the illusion somewhat. It was a dump. But being the only diner in a 40 mile radius meant that it was busy. Every permutation of every possible decision meant people's lives would crisscross here like tracks in the snow. Their impact only felt until the snow melted. Toilet breaks, rest stops, breakdowns, refueling, and a million other contrivances of consequence drew strangers here. Whatever their motive, I doubted the promise of quality food was one of them. A hunch of smoke clung jealously to the ceiling outside the kitchen door, where a steady stream of plates were shuttled to the tables. The taste of greasy air kept toying with the back of my throat. To me it made no odds. I didn't really care. I wasn't here to eat their food. It was about 9.30pm. I had been sat here in a booth alone long enough that my coffee had become cold and long enough that my waitress had noticed. Deep red lipstick, violet eyeshadow, red horn rim glasses, and squeezed into a uniform that shouted walking cliché. Though she was a large lady, she had made a better job of shrink wrapping herself than they had done the tables. The seams of her dress strained as she strode towards me with an air of practiced authority. Her red frizzy hair gently bounced as she approached, thrusting out her large breasts which bounced in unison, albeit not so gently. She looked like something from a far side cartoon. I allowed myself a wry smile, and it must have come off as insincere. Something wrong with the coffee there, darling, she said, her lazy drawl making it more of an accusation than a question. Uh, no, sorry, I was miles away. You want a refill? This is our busiest time and I can't have you taking up a booth fat pain for anything. Thudding her coffee pot down beside my cup. She smell of lipstick and chip fat. I looked past her breast and into her eyes. She was looking for confrontation, so I merely smiled and nodded in acquiescence. Tutting, she poured me another cup. Her fat fingers bursting out from under her rings, of which she had many. Her hands reminded me of balloon animals. I noticed no wedding ring though, and through her confidence around men, she must have been married. Divorced now or widowed then, complexity hidden by triviality. Like the coffee she poured. She caught me staring at her fingers, and questioning my probing eyes turned fast and made her way back towards the kitchen. I watched her for a moment, angry with myself that I would given her a reason to remember me. Almost in sympathy of my concern, she recognised someone entering the diner, and squealing with delight gave this rather fat man a warm embrace. He returned the gesture, squeezing both her and the mild annoyance from my mind. The diner had filled up by now and the atmosphere was thick with conversation. Hushed speech hung in the air like smoke, anonymous talk that was familiar but at the same time foreign. I liked it here. I was ambiguous like the words. The chatter intertwined like vines meaning being lost in the noise. 
a phrase or two recognisable, but the overall effect was like static. One of the purest truths is that you can never feel more alone than when in a large crowd of strangers. This made me feel invisible, and was something I thrived on. Spending much of my time in places like these, you understand how people enjoy being around other people, while simultaneously being alone. No eye contact made and conversation rarely struck up, sharing time with others privately. Tonight was different. In the corner was a group of three, two men and a girl. Both men must have been late twenties. Their denims, edge sneakers and dirty hooded jumpers made them look immediately out of place with the usual trucker clientele. I assumed the girl was the girlfriend of one, possibly both. Her hair was dark, greasy and pinned back in a ponytail. She looked tired and kept pulling the sleeves of her jumper over her hands like a nervous tick. Both men were sat opposite each other, having an intent discussion. They were perched on their elbows, arguing about something or other. As they talked, their eyes wandered through the faces of the diner. They were surveying the customers, gauging everyone, in particular sizing up the men. I knew this, because this is what I did. The bigger of the two had a shaven head with a dusting of stubble that gleamed with sweat. His pronounced jaw and low brow made him look slow, but his intelligence was betrayed by his eyes. They moved fast through the patchwork of faces, analysing the men, summarising who would be the greatest threat and who needed to be controlled. He met my gaze and immediately his eyes danced from mine with a jolt of disinterest. Most likely due to my small frame and pale, sickly complexion. The smaller of the two was agitated and nervous. He had his head and eyes underneath his hood and was flicking the tip of a fork off his bottom lip, compounding the neuroticism of the girl who snatched at the fork with one of her small hands. Echoing the girl's anxiety, the fork nervously danced from her grip across the tabletop, clattering against the wall and landing on the floor. The noise evaporated into the bustle of the evening's trade. But the smaller of the two men froze and glared at the girl. His shoulders hunched, and with slow deliberation he reached across to the girl's hands and squeezed her knuckles until his went white. The larger man reached across and touched the other's forearm, nodding to the oblivious patrons lost in their thoughts and talk. He let go. Her hand whipped back into her sleeve and she wiped the newly emerging tears from her eyes. I looked down at my coffee. I hadn't intended to drink the last cup and I didn't intend to drink this cup. I found the black liquid more soothing to my mind than my body. I loved how the dark circle absorbed all light, casting no reflection as I stared at it. Almost like it was listening to and contemplating my thoughts. As my coffee gazed back, I felt a pang of hunger deep within me rising to the tip of my throat. This helped sharpen my thoughts. It was now at the peak of the evening's trade. I would normally act, but the situation had become dangerously unpredictable, with the addition of the three strangers. We were at opposite ends of a chessboard, but only one side knew they were playing. It hardly seemed fair. The larger of the men reached out and held the girl's hands in his. He spoke softly and deliberately to her for a moment, and pulling a sports bag from under the table, digging through its contents, he handed her something wrapped in a dirty towel. She stood and tentatively made her way towards the entrance, quietly slipping out the front door, careful not to open it wide enough that the bell perched above the frame rang. She'd no doubt stand outside, guarding the entrance and blocking off anyone trying to get out, whilst keeping watch. She was hardly intimidating, so I assumed she'd have a gun on her. No doubt they all would. As I watched her shadow framed by the moonlight steady behind the thin blind of the entrance, I felt the leader's eyes settle on me. Ignoring his gaze, I rubbed my temple, feigning a headache. I didn't want to give him any reason to approach me first. Feeling his eyes leave me, I looked up as he began to climb onto the table. Some other heads followed in mild amusement as he stood to his full height, forcing attention from the bewildered patrons. My waitress propelled herself from behind the counter, firing a volley of expletives, but the words travelled further than she did, freezing mid-stride. 
her jaw hanging slack in recognition of the object now unveiled in his hands. The entire diner was combined in a moment of silent incomprehension before he raised his sawn-off shotgun and released a blast of buck into the styrofoam ceiling tiles. In the small confines of the diner, the noise was absolutely deafening, and seconds later the ringing in my ears was replaced by a chorus of terrified screams. A tidal wave of human emotion overcame my senses, a harsh, painful noise that made me close my eyes and grit my teeth. Male or female? It's always hard to tell which is which when someone is truly scared. The shot must have gone through a strip light as the remaining lights joined in with the panic, blinking on and off in terror-stricken fear. Dust rained from the demolished ceiling tiles like ash and snow, the malfunctioning bulbs causing a strobe effect, giving the scene the look of a stop-motion nightmare. The lights managed to catch their breath and lit the entire scene in harsh reality, just as the leader brought the butt of his gun down on the head of the waitress's fat friend, who attempted a clumsy run for the kitchen. An exclamation mark of blood sparked from his skull and he collapsed, moaning into a crumpled heap on the vinyl-tiled floor. There was a sharp pause of bewilderment, but then the screams began anew with renewed vigour. The shooter had began to shout, and as his words took hold of the patron's attention, the screams wilted into sobs, and silence slowly descended across the diner. A heavy grey veil of violent intent had rolled over the room, a veil so heavy it bowed the heads of everyone, forcing their eyes to the floor. If you hadn't already guessed, this is a feckin' robbery. We're just here for the till money, and your bloody money, that's all. We're not here to hurt anyone. I'm sorry about that poor fella, but I had to show you we weren't arsing around. We've done this before and we're bloody good at it. So no heroes, okay? It's just bloody money, and we need it more than you do. He was Irish. Dublin, I guessed. His relaxed brogue seemed to antagonise the intent of his language, but his exaggerated curses caused some to cower even more, as if the words themselves could cause harm. Your man here's gonna come round with a bag. I want your wallets, phones, and car keys. No one talks, just put everything in the feckin' bag. Until he comes around, keep your eyes on the ground, and your hands on the table. You don't want to die in this hole now, do you? He let his words hang in the air for a moment, the silence almost as hostile as his words, daring someone to retaliate. There was no reply. He had his captive audience. The smaller of the two pulled his hood back as he approached the first table with an open duffel bag. Seeing him now in the light, he was younger than I first guessed, although it was hard to tell as his face resembled a crushed ball of paper. Complimenting his visage was a plaster over a recently broken nose, the redness from the injury radiating out across his cheeks forming blue and purple tip wings under both eye sockets. His hairline seemed to be as repulsed by his face as everyone else and was making a hasty retreat across the top of his skull, leaving a few wispy footprints in its wake. He was a user, barbiturates most likely by the sorry state of his skin like tissue paper caught in the branches of a winter tree. His flesh clung so closely to his bones that he looked like a bloodless ghost. I visibly flinched at the thought, and this is when he noticed me. You, you there, get your, get your, fe- get your wallet out now. Irish also, although the accent was further south. It was difficult to pinpoint as the drugs had seemingly ravaged his brain as well as his body. Calm down, John. Do the tables and I'll keep an eye on him. You might want to do what my friend said and get your wallet out there, son. Your man there's a little nervous and I'd rather he didn't make a mess. The leader had climbed from the table and taken position by the till, holding on to my waitress's hair who was on her knees by his feet. She was trembling so much her blouse appeared to be vibrating and her meticulous makeup had morphed into twin black streams that ran from her eyes into a red bloom around her mouth that was formerly her lipstick. I held up the palm of my left hand as I put my right into my shirt pocket, pulling out $40 and $5 notes, and threw it onto the table surface. The notes extravagantly fanned out as they hit the table, as if to proudly emphasise their lack of value. Is that it? Keys and phone there, son. Come on now, we're not playing around. His sentence was punctuated by a soundtrack of sobs, 
as he pulled on the waitress's hair each syllable. She pleaded at me through wide, watercolour eyes. I don't have a phone. I don't have a car. I spoke to the leader, but my eyes stayed with the addict. What, what the feck are you looking at, you, you stupid... He was cut off by a guffaw from his friend. Ha! You're Scottish? No wonder you only had 40 bucks on you, you tight bastard, you. I'm afraid I'm going to have to address the obvious white elephant in the room here, though, fella. Why would you be at a freeway diner if you didn't have a car now? I don't need a car. I don't use a mobile. We son, just give them what they want. We all want to get through this. A whimpering voice drifted over from somewhere to my right. Could have been any one of them. You might want to listen to your man there, Jack. We're in a hurry, you see. I held both my hands in the air and shrugged, while still holding the addict's stare. I gave him a smile. You f... He pushed the bag onto the floor, picked up his shotgun and came towards me. He seemed so weak that he had to rest one hand underneath the barrel to support his weight. I slowly put my hands face down on the table, careful not to break his gaze as he approached me. His exaggerated skill making his facial bruising look like oil and water. Without the gun, he would pose no problem. With the gun, much the same. Now, John, calm down now. We said we are going to be clean and quick. Will you just get the bag and we'll be done? What you looking at, you, you manky freak? John stood in front of me, forcing his chest out with every sinew in his being. He clearly thought I was no threat. I held my smile. He violently thrust the tip of the barrel into my forehead, jerking my head back against the seat. My sight blurred for a moment as a cold trickle of blood welled in the corner of my eye from the semicircular gash in my forehead. As the blood caressed its way down the underside of my chin, I gave John an even bigger smile, this time a large, toothy grin. Through his self-inflicted fog of substance abuse, his brain struggled to make sense of what he'd seen, but in an instant the mist cleared and he turned in revulsion just as the girl burst through the front door. There's a truck pulling into the car park. What's taking so long? She said. He's a fuck. That's all John managed as I quickly rose up from the table, grabbing his gun arm and yanking it away from his body. His weak frame relented in my grip, and using his arm to point his gun at the girl, I cradled his jaw and neck in my right hand, holding his face level with mine and looking directly at the leader. He levelled his gun at me, letting go of the waitress's hair. She clumsily crawled on her elbows under the nearest table, which made a poor job of concealing her considerable rear. Okay now, fella. Don't do anything rash here. We were never going to hurt anyone. We were just here for the cash, like we said. Just shoot the sculpture. I squeezed John's jaw tightly and I felt his drool run down the palm of my hand as he started choking in his own tongue. Don't hurt him or I'll shoot you, pal. Two of us, one of you, fella. Put him down and leave. Take the gun if you like, but just go. I turned my head, looking at the girl. It must have begun to rain outside as her black hair was flattened to her head and the night's moisture shined across her red cheeks. She was aiming the gun at me, but her shoulders were pushed far back betraying the fear in both the weapon in her hand and its intended target. Under the grime and misfortune, she was a pretty girl. Her green eyes nestled in teary hammocks that broke when she blinked. Put the gun down, turn around, walk away and forget about tonight. This is not you. Call your family, tell them you're sorry and go home. I spoke softly and deliberate. She glanced at the gun in my hand and I lifted the barrel towards the ceiling. She looked over my shoulder at the Irishman who was still pointing his gun at the back of my head. Jess, don't you feckin' go anywhere. This freak is just trying to scare you. We're in control. Your parents don't need you, Jess, but right now I do. Holding her eyes in mine, I shook my head. She took a step back towards the door and slowly lowered the gun. Her shoulders began quivering in time with the tears that were now streaming down her face. 
Keep your feckin' gun pointed at this prick, Jess. I... I I'm sorry, Joe. I, I can't. She knelt and put the gun on the ground, and as she stood again I gave her a reassuring nod, and she quickly slipped out the door into the cool night air. No! You can't! I pulled back John's head, straining his neck and putting pressure on his already injured nose. His eyes pleaded and jolted from side to side in fearful discord. The same cowering voice came again from the corner of the diner. Please let us go, sir. We're just customers here and have no quarrel with either of you. Please let us leave and none of us will call the police. You could almost taste the subservience. It disgusted me. Sit down and shut up. Eyes now trained on me in a cacophony of confusion. If they thought I was their saviour, they were wrong. Okay now, Jock, we'll call this a day. I'll put the gun down now and follow my girl out. Just let go of my friend there and... Come closer. What? Come closer and we'll talk. Just the three of us. Keep the gun pointed in my head if you like. Like a child approaching the end of a diving board, he edged towards me until the barrel of his gun touched the skin of my throat, and our free faces were breaths width apart. John's eyes darted furiously between us as his hot, panicked breath tried to force my hand away from his face through his nose. Go on then, I laughed. <laughs> of all the diners, you chose this one tonight. A second passed, and watching my mouth, his pupils dilated fully as I sensed the kinetic motion that would precede him pulling the trigger. I hit him hard in the chest with my right arm and he flew backwards, his thighs hitting the counter, sending him somersaulting behind the till. John startled and began to struggle. Pulling his gun hand back and grasping under his jaw, I wrenched hard, tearing his head from his neck the only resistance being a slick popping noise. His body slumped to my feet with barely a sound, his sullied blood pulling on the parquet, almost relieved to escape its diseased host. Pandemonium. The twenty or so patrons nervously exploded from their seats searching for any exit they could find. Elbows flying and necks straining, they climbed over each other like frightened ants to reach the perceived safety of the dark. One man went straight through one of the main windows. A crescendo of grunts and smashed glass followed him into the light summer rain. More followed in his wake out the window, landing on his prostrate form, crunching glass into his back as he struggled to catch his breath. The blinds blown by the breeze swung up towards the ceiling, almost as if they would do anything to stay away from the night, followed by the cool air and the swirling rain. The waitress was on her knees, trying to coax her friend from his stupor. He came to, and whilst she tried to lift him, pain caught up with his consciousness and he wailed out in agonised confusion. Her tears had melted her makeup into the mask of a nightmarish mime, and as he focused on her for the first time, he cried out again. I dropped both the gun and John's head, stepping over his legs as she recoiled behind his torso. As I walked on, she quickly scurried out the open door into the screams of the night, leaving her friend mumbling incoherently as I turned my back. I rounded the till and found the Irishman, face down, his left shoulder clearly dislocated, his right arm outstretched to his gun lying just out of grasp. Squatting down beside him, I picked up the gun, checking on the fresh shell in the chamber. Attention on the weapon, he shook his head from side to side, as tears fled from his eyes in absolute terror. P please, please don't hurt me. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I won't, I won't ever. Don't apologize. I admire you. You take what you want, just as God. No, just as nature intended, just as I do. I grabbed him by the throat and lifted him up against the thin wall, looking directly into his eyes. The injured trucker had regained his senses and was wailing as he slipped drunkenly about on the tar-like blood that had streamed from the headless corpse at his feet. Still holding the Irishman's throat, I aimed the shotgun at the trucker's head and pulled the trigger, removing his face in a cloud of red mist. His body collapsed to the floor 
limbs twitching and jerking independently of his limbs twitching and jerking independently of his control, oblivious to the fate of their host brain. The Irishman writhed and strained in revulsion at the scene. He'd obviously never seen what a pliance of his threats could do, and it was unlikely he'd appreciate the irony of his present situation. What, what are you? An invitation of blood had spilled down his face from a deep gouge above his right eye, and I could feel the steady anticipation rise in my body. I fought to hold it back, but the excitement rolled up my back across my shoulders and into my arms, inadvertently tightening my grip around his throat, as if the very thirst were impatient itself. I leaned into his ear and whispered the last sentence his brain would ever be able to comprehend. There's always a bigger fish. I grabbed him by the hair and pulled his head back, exposing his neck. The sinews of his muscles rippled across his skin, slightly pulsed from the blood being forced through his veins. His elevated heart rate almost sympathetic to my thirst tempting me from within. He closed his eyes tightly as if hiding his mind would blind the pain. They all did. My chest swelled as I let the thirst take over and bit into his throat and tearing away at the skin, muscle and cartilage. Like a rose waking in the dawn light, his neck opened invitingly for me, blood pulsing from the wound. I put my lips to his throat and drank greedily. With each gulp I felt a warm wave washing through me, filling me with life as the Irishman slowly faded. As the flow stemmed I squeezed his abdomen hard and the stream gained in strength once more before finally dying. I pulled my mouth away and arched my back and screamed out into the air of the almost empty diner. Thus now satisfied, relinquished control over my senses and I looked at my prey as the last of his life left him. The fear was gone from his eyes, although there was no peace. A purely human invention to give meaning to the emptiness of death. His brain simply had stopped forming discernible emotion as his synapses slowly misfired. I released him into oblivion with a quick turn of his head and lay his body gently on the floor. As I walked into the cold night air, I looked towards the sky, letting the rain wash the fast congealing blood from my mouth and neck. The clouds gently glowed as the rain fell in infinite, exquisite patterns onto my face. I smiled and closed my eyes, enjoying the moment. The invigoration of my meal mixing with the godlike feeling of power that only the hunt can give. As the rain intensified into hard, unforgiving sheets, I looked across the parking lot, and the remains of the patrons who had left the diner in such haste moments earlier. Heads, arms, viscera. A result of a feeding frenzy. The teeming rain mixed with the steam rising from the still warm blood painted like a carpet across the lot. The younger ones had no control. Their hunger was driven by pure, ancient instinct. That's why I kept them outside, in the shadows, until the time was right. Bertram couldn't be sure how long Emmeline had been dead. She had been in the bathroom taking one of her late afternoon soaks. He hadn't heard a peep out of her since she had turned off the faucets over an hour ago. He didn't think much about it. After all, they were both in their early 70s, and as you got older, things naturally took longer. Bertram was kicked back in his time-worn recliner watching baseball. It was now well into the fourth inning when the thought hit him to check on her. Lord, what if she's fallen and knocked herself unconscious? He had sat through enough of those medical alert commercials to know that it was relatively easy to end up on the kitchen floor or 
and this was when the disturbing mental picture took hold of him, a bathtub full of water. He got up, walked to the bathroom, and banged on the door. You okay in there? She didn't answer, so he opened the unlocked door and stepped inside. Emmeline was sitting in the tub, her head tilted to the side. She appeared to be napping. Emmeline? Emmeline, honey? He inched closer to the tub. The knot in his stomach grew tighter as he reached out and pushed her shoulder. She slumped down to the water line. He jumped back as if the tub had sent an electrical shock through him. Bertram's quaking hand felt her neck for a pulse, but found none. He stared at her chest for any movement. It was still. Oh, Lordy Lord, Emmeline? Oh, Jesus, no. He backed out of the bathroom until he bumped into the wall in the hallway. He turned and staggered to the living room and dropped down onto the recliner. Bertram was shaky and confused. Once he collected and arranged his thoughts, he realized that the first thing he needed to do was contact the authorities. He shut off the TV, turned, lifted the receiver of the landline phone on the small table next to him, and began dialing 911. Then the voice called from the bathroom. Bertram? Are you there? He froze, his fingers still hovering over the one button on the phone's receiver. He reminded himself there were no such things as ghosts. He dialed the one, then he heard the waters stirring, followed by the faint sound of feet sliding over the tile floor toward the bathroom door. In his mind's eye, Bertram watched the doorknob slowly turn and heard the telltale creak of the door hinges. The wet footsteps squished as they dragged down the hall and toward the living room. Bertram laid the receiver on the table and stared straight ahead at the darkened TV screen. He could see his own reflection in the living room around him. His peripheral vision detected the form stepping out of the hall. He stayed focused on the TV mirror. He might lose what little sanity he had left if he looked directly at her. He panted as the body wrapped in a white bathrobe sauntered past him and sat down in the chair next to him. Bertram, I feel funny, she said. I hope I didn't have a stroke or something. Emmeline looked over to him. Bertram, what's wrong with you? Look at me when I'm a talking to you. Bertram worked up enough courage to swivel his head toward her like a wobbly animatronic. When he saw that his wife was very much alive and not some revenant taunting him, his body relaxed and his heart rate returned to near normal. Baby? He asked with more relief than fear. God of Moses, darling. I thought you'd gone and died in the bathtub. Died in the bathtub? What's gotten into you, you old fool? She smiled and snickered at him. You was in the tub for a while, so I went check on you. You weren't breathing or moving or nothing. When I touched you, you slumped over like a loose fence post. Are you sure you're all right? Yes, Bertram. I think I might remember dying. I probably just fainted. Them new blood pressure pills Doc Melbourne has me on has been giving me the woozies. I'll call him tomorrow and get that straightened out. She shot a quick glance at the antique clock on the mantel and said, Good gracious, would you look at the time? Have you eaten anything? Well, of course, Emmeline. The first thing I thought of when I figured you was dead was to go into the kitchen and stuff my pie hole. Oh, Bertram. She mewed through one of the loving smiles he always found endearing. You must be starved. I'll whip you up some fried cube steak and mashed potatoes. Ain't you hungry too? You know how much dying can wear a body out. Ha ha, ain't you a riot. You know, for some reason, I ain't hungry. Well, how about you get on to bed and rest yourself then? I've got more of a hankering for a peanut butter and nanner sandwich. All right then, I am feeling pretty run down. I'll see you in the morning. I sure hope so. Emmeline got up from her chair, stood over him, and kissed him on top of his balding head before heading off to bed. Sweet Jesus, how her lips are cold. A good half hour before even God himself was set to awaken, the rooster crowed. Bertram sat up in bed, rubbed his eyes, and swung his legs over the side. He drew in the familiar fragrance wafting in from the kitchen. Bertram loved the smell of freshly brewed coffee and bacon in the morning. 
he threw on some fresh overalls and made a beeline to his breakfast. He leaned over the stove in the kitchen and sniffed the frying pans that created what he liked to think of as the morning miracle. He poured himself a mug of hot black coffee and sat down at the small table by the kitchen window where he was greeted by the glorious sight of one of Emmeline's life-altering breakfasts. He was about to place the napkin in his lap when it dawned on him that Emmeline wasn't buzzing around the way she typically did. His stomach lurched at the thought that she may have passed out again. Hey, honey, where are you at? I'm down here. Emmeline hollered from the root cellar where she stored her delicious homemade jellies. Soon the cellar's two heavy doors slammed shut. Bertram heard her grunting as she climbed up the three stairs of the side porch. Darling, are you okay? Do you need some help? No, I'm good. Just needed to grab a fresh jar of jelly. Emmeline replied. Bertram started loading up his plate with scrambled eggs. He heard the squeal of the long spring on the screen door stretching. Come on, old woman, or I'll start the blessing without you. Emmeline scooted past him as he saturated his eggs with Tabasco sauce. He was stretching for the bacon just as she was sitting down. She reached across the table and placed the jelly at the center, next to the biscuit's covered bowl. The jar was her strawberry blend. Bertram read the personalized note on the label affixed to the front. Strappin' strawberry. Main ingredient? Love. He smiled as if he were reading the sentiment for the first time. I don't know what's up with me this morning. My joints feel so stiff. Emmeline complained. Oh now, Emmeline, you know neither of us is exactly a spring chick. Bertram looked at her. She had dark circles under her slightly milky eyes. Purple veins crisscrossed her upper torso. Bertram, what is it? Are you all right? You look like you've seen a ghost. Bertram swallowed hard. Emmeline, baby, have you looked in a mirror? No, I just threw on my dress and got about my business. I didn't have the energy to go comb my hair or brush my teeth. Besides, who's there to try and impress way out here anyways? Speaking of teeth, my jaw feels tight. It's making it hard to talk. Do you think I might have gotten a tick bite? Those things can cause all kinds of bad symptoms. Bertram didn't feel like eating anymore. I think we ought to get you in the truck and go to the ER over in Campbell. That's nearly an hour from here. Just let me see if I can stomach some food. Then I'll go take some aspirin and lie down. I'll be all right. Here. Let me see if you got a fever first. Bertram felt her forehead. He snatched his hand back. Bertram, what is it? Do I have a temperature or not? Sweetie, you don't have no temperature at all. You're colder than an Eskimo's nose. Are you sure you don't want me to rush you to the hospital in Campbell? There's no telling what you might have caught. No, I'm too tired to even walk out to the truck. Just help me get back to bed. I don't think I can hold anything down after all. We'll see how I feel later. All right, if you're sure. Bertram took her arm. He nearly yelped. It felt as if her arm had turned into an unyielding rubber. When he finally got her to the bedroom, he began unbuttoning the back of her dress. He noticed it was damp, and her skin had a slight sheen to it. After he lowered her onto the bed, he covered her up and kissed her frigid forehead before heading to the living room to give all of this a good think. Throughout the morning and early afternoon, Bertram checked on her four times. Each time she was sleeping. Worn out by questions and concerns, he nodded off in the recliner. A while later, he awoke with a start and saw the early evening's faint shadows beginning to take shape on the living room's wall. He had drifted off earlier in the afternoon, which meant Emmeline hadn't been checked on for hours. Bertram gave a slight grunt as he hauled himself up and out of his chair. He was just beginning to get acclimated to alertness when he heard a gurgling voice cry out from the back bedroom. Bertram! Her voice sounded like it was underwater. Bertram was running down the hall when the odd smell hit him. It was like rotten fruit and spoiled meat. He charged through the bedroom door, flipped on the light switch, and blocked his howl with his palm. Bertram, she asked. Do I look odd to you? I feel different from this morning. 
What do you think's going on? Bertram had no response for the waxy corpse sitting on the edge of the bed. Then his attention shifted to the stomach-churning stench emanating from the thick pus oozing from the popping blisters covering her reddish body. I feel sick. Will you help get me to the bathroom? Bertram stood there, gawking at her. He didn't know if he should run screaming from the house or call an ambulance. Bertram, help me, she pleaded. He walked to the bed. Emmeline held up a waterlogged arm, and Bertram grimaced as he took hold of it. He began lifting her up to a standing position and felt the top layer of her skin slip a little. His repulsion made him pause. Bertram, get me to the toilet. It was enough to snap him back. After helping Emmeline up, he stepped back a bit but held his arms out to catch her if she fell, though he dreaded having to touch her again. Once he had directed her into the bathroom, she shuffled toward the toilet. She bent forward slightly and vomited up copious amounts of blackish blood and small chunky pieces. Feeling his own gorge rising, Bertram said, I'm so sorry as he dashed from the bathroom and out to the side porch where he did some puking of his own. As he was finishing, it gradually dawned on him that he had left his ailing wife alone in the bathroom dealing with her own fear and discomfort. Wiping his mouth with the back of his hand, he composed himself as best he could and ventured back inside. The only thing worse than Emmeline's hideous appearance was the horrendous smell of decaying flesh that now permeated the back of the house. He grabbed a handkerchief from a pocket in his overalls and covered his nose and mouth. Emmeline, where are you, sugar? Bathroom, the croaking voice replied. She was hunched over the porcelain sink, her darkened hands gripping the sides. Oh, Bertram, she whispered. Bertram approached the sink. He couldn't see Emmeline's face. Her oily hair had fallen forward over her brow. Bloody teeth clogged the drain. I think we might be looking at more than some tick bite or fainting spell. The conclusion he was coming to unleashed a bevy of goosebumps all over his body. She wasn't merely ill. She was a withering corpse. Bertram had seen enough dead farm animals. Emmeline was just as gone as they had been. He had no idea what to do think or say. Then the small crumb of rationality told him that the first thing he needed to do was become more practical. Crying in confusion would not help. He could no longer think of Emmeline as his beloved high school sweetheart and wife of over 50 years. She was now a body he had to deal with. His first course of action was to get her out of the house. Emmeline, sweetness, let's get you on a porch. I think we both could use some fresh air. She remained still at first and then made four small turns to her left until she was facing the bathroom doorway. You want me to help you? Bertram asked. He was relieved when she didn't answer. Once she made it to the porch, Emmeline managed to bend her knees enough to lower herself down onto one of the rocking chairs. Bertram attempted to conceal the look of disgust on his face about her joints loud cracking as she sat down. Foamy blood leaked from her mouth and nose. They say there's dignity in death, Bertram thought. But there ain't nothing dignified about my wife right now. He felt the need to cover her wretched body with something. Sugar, would you like a blanket? Emmeline nodded ever so slightly, her neck making the cringe-worthy cracking sound again. Bertram pulled in a deep breath. Holding on to it for as long as possible, he jogged to the bedroom closet for the blanket. Once he was back outside, he tenderly wrapped the blanket around her and sat in the other rocking chair. Neither said a word. They stared out across the yard at the fading springtime sun as it slid softly and colorfully behind the tree line. Bertram rocked back and forth. He tried desperately to direct his mind toward any other place but the porch he was sharing with a dead woman. Bertram let his gaze wash over the front property, corralled by a long stretch of wire fencing. He was wrapped as he took notice of the straight rows of neatly planted corn. They reminded him of a battalion of soldiers standing at attention. God, how I love the country life. It surely does agree with me. But the merciful distraction dissipated as his thoughts circled back to Emmeline. 
He recalled fondly the acreage portion that she had claimed, the magical place that ran along the north side of the house that gave the fruit bushes their first breath of glorious life. She used the berries she grew to create her wondrous and delectable delights. His lips trembled as he remembered the unique labels she made for each jar. She'd give each flavor a catchy name, like Big Bad Blueberry, Betcha Lycum Blackberry, or Really Red Raspberry. And just as she had done on the label for the strawberry jelly she had served at breakfast, she always finished out the stickers with the affectionate phrase, Main Ingredient, Love. As the hours wore on, Emmeline's wet breathing slowed. Her once bold eyes grew dull and distant. Despite his effort to stay awake with her, Bertram eventually fell into a deep and uneasy sleep. He was so drained that he slept past the rooster for one of the very few times in his adult life. He was awakened by a loud buzzing. Emmeline was still gazing well past nowhere. Her eyes had receded deep into their sockets. The buzzing that Bertram heard was the numerous flying insects rushing in and out of her open mouth, invading her nose and ears. Her greenish body had bloated. It looked as though her stomach was set to burst. Due to the grotesque swelling, her blanket had slipped off. For Emmeline's sake, Bertram tried to remain stoic. It would be cruel to let her witness her husband's revulsion. His disordered mind made it difficult for him to decide on what he should do for his wife at this awful moment. He did know that he would never leave her with the relentless flies and their maggots. More importantly, he would never allow anyone else to see her in her current ghastly state. The authorities be damned. I'm fading, Burr. She mumbled. What can I do, darling? Tell me what I can do for you. She struggled mightily to make herself understood. Put me back in the tub, please. Let me try and wash this mess off of me. It was hard for Bertram to watch the filthy insects pushed out of her mouth as she spoke. It seemed evil and profane, and it brought about a wave of anger. I'll go get the bath ready, he said. I'll be back in a jiffy. When he returned to the porch, he had his handkerchief tied around the lower half of his face. Then he placed one arm under Emmeline's knees, now stiff with rigor mortis, and the other across her shifting shoulder blades and carried her to the bathroom. The muscles in his lower back strained as he placed her down into the water's warm comfort. He stood up straight to loosen his back muscles and noticed that his arms were sticky and stained. Do you want me to help wash you off? No. Just leave me. Bertram shuddered as he realized that this was likely the last time he would ever hear his wife's voice. Call if you need anything. He went back out to the front porch to clear his head and allow the tears to purge his heart. He waited there for a very long time, but Emmeline still hadn't called for him. When he couldn't take the silence and worry any longer, he recovered his mouth and nose with his handkerchief and returned to the bathroom. Emmeline was slumped over, just as she had been the first time he found her. Her skin was turning black, and there was a slimy film on the surface of the water. Worse yet, her body was beginning to liquefy. The odor that rippled through his mask was the worst by far. Bertram opened a window and then bolted back outside to wretch. Lord, please help me. What in the world am I going to do? He shouted. But heaven was silent. Should he now call the authorities? And if he did, what would he tell them? What might they make of his wife's decomposed body? Would they think him a ghoul and lock him away? There was going to be an investigation and many questions he couldn't possibly answer. Bertram needed a place to think. He walked around to the side of the house and stood near Emmeline's garden, where her prized crop flourished. He paced anxiously, frazzled and useless, hoping for an idea. Then he abruptly stopped. As Bertram gazed upon the columns of ripened berries, an inexplicable feeling of calmness enveloped him. The garden's peacefulness brought clarity, allowing him to ponder a few simple ideas rather than trudge through a complicated maze of elaborate plans. The decision he made felt not so much correct as it did proper. For Bertram, this was now a sacred place of remembrance, 
a place where a woman's love nurtured the rich brown earth that had yielded so much sweetness and beauty. Now he knew what in the world he was going to do. He let her sit in the tub for over a week so nature could finish the job it had screwed up before. Then he dug a hole out by her garden and began pouring her remains into it. When he got down to the last of it, Bertram picked up the small jar he had brought with him and filled it. He screwed on the two-piece metal lid, took a pen from one of his overalls chest pockets, and scribbled some words on the blank label. Bertram carried the jar down to its final resting place. There it would serve as a small monument to a love that would continue far beyond its 50-plus years of earthly existence. He said a few words of prayer, then solemnly ascended the stairs of the root cellar. He lowered its doors as if they were the lid of a coffin. There in the darkness, on a row of tall racks, sat a jar of dark jelly. Written on the white label were the words, Amazing Emmeline. Main ingredient? Love. His teeth crunched into another handful of spiders. The pimple-popping nature of their exploding abdomens under his gnashing teeth made Jay sick to his stomach. The way too audible sound of the popping didn't help either. Looks like that's another five spiders, Jay. You're falling behind. Josh mumbled through a mouthful of spider bits, the flecks of legs spraying out. He grinned widely with chunks of fleshy, chewed spider stuck in his teeth. Never go up against Josh in a spider-eating contest. Josh wrapped his dirty fingers around another floorboard in the abandoned house. The rusty nails gave way and the board snapped like a dusty old cracker. And underneath, dozens of fat-bellied spiders scrambled away, perhaps knowing what Josh intended to do with them. His hand broke through the nest of old webbing, and the panicked spiders bit him frantically. But Josh didn't even flinch. As the spiders tried to escape or fight, Josh pointed with his other hand and counted each one of them. Oh, oh, oh Jay, looks like I have another eight of these delicious motherfuckers. <laughs> Just like their eight legs or eight eyes. He threw them into his mouth. A few tried to web away, but Josh was able to wrangle them in without much difficulty. In his mouth, the spiders again did their best to flee Josh's hungry maw, but his tongue whipped around and sucked in all eight spiders. Once more, guts popped out of his obnoxious open mouth chewing. Through his sloppy chomping, Josh mocked Jay. <laughs> Looks like that makes it 58 to what? <laughs> Four? <laughs> you got some catching up to do, buddy. <laughs> Josh laughed, half choking on the half-living spiders. Jay stared up with his lip curled in repulsion. His own face was pale and sweaty. Gulping a long, wet, loud gulp, he looked at the juicy spider he had pinched between his fingers. Jay knew it was impossible, but the look of the spider made it seem anxious or nervous perhaps even silently begging for mercy. It was a very plump spider, perhaps even pregnant. Josh told him that he had let Jay count it as two. Its legs flicked wildly and tried mightily to bite Jay's fingertips with its sharp mandibles. Jay looked right into the disgusting black eyes of the thing. The fear was quite evident now, but Jay had to do what he had to do. You don't just back out of a spider-eating contest. As a man, what honor do you have left? Jay dangled the terror-stricken arachnid over his tongue and dropped it. The quick chewing did nothing to improve the simultaneously squishy and crunchy texture. Hot pus squished between his teeth. Then he felt the crawling. It turned out that the little lady was indeed pregnant and carrying an untold amount of spiderlings in her swollen belly. They spilled loose from their mother's mangled body and flooded Jay's mouth, scurrying everywhere, coating his tongue and squeezing between the gaps of his teeth. Jay stumbled back, trying to keep his mouth closed, but the thousands of little spider feet tickled his uvula and he gagged. 
coughing up some of the babies. Josh's attention turned to Jay, his fists full of spiders wriggled free from his dirty red bike covered hand. Jay felt awful. He tried to frantically chew up the spiderlings as they scuttled out of his mouth, around his teeth and tongue, and down his throat. Their virgin webs crisscrossed randomly, for they knew not what this world was or how to survive. Josh looked worried and began running over to Jay. A pregnant spider was like hitting the jackpot in the spider-eating contest. Through his struggle and revulsion, Jay realized this too. Maybe he can still win. He grabbed a bottle of water and washed down what was already in his mouth, and then tried to scrape the escapees back into his wet lips. The poor little bodies were mashed and ripped apart against Jay's stubble, but he didn't care. He showed no mercy. Josh tackled Jay. A pregnant spider like that could have up to a thousand spiderlings. Even if they agreed that spiderlings only count as a tenth of a spider in the spider-eating contest, that would still give Jay 100 points, and that would be disastrous for Josh. So Josh threw his body full force into Jay. Together they crashed through the sagging drywall and into the next room. Dust and mold spores filled the air, making them both cough. More spiders spilled from the open hole, but the true prize was still crawling all over Jay. The spiderlings covered his face and neck almost completely. Josh lunged in tongue first and began licking up as many as he could. Cheater! Those are mine! Jay gurgled with a throat full of spiderlings. He punched Josh right in the chops with a now spiderling covered fist. He hit with enough force to dislodge a spider bit's covered tooth from Josh's jaw, splattering his cheek in translucent yellow guts. Jay started slurping up the remaining spiderlings from his hands as fast as humanly possible before Josh could retaliate, but before he could, the rotting floor gave way and they both dropped into the cellar. The cellar was beyond thick with webs and spider activity, and the two men were almost cushioned as they fell to the basement floor. They both coughed hard, lung-rattling coughs, feeling as though they each inhaled a substantial amount of dusty webs. Aside from the hole above them, the dirty spider silk obscured any obvious way out of the cellar. Josh tried to shuffle forward, but crawling through the webs felt like wading through molasses. The spiders down here were much more evasive and distant. Josh! Jay lay flat on his back, wheezing. We gotta get out of this basement! Jay did his best to look around, but he couldn't find Josh anywhere. All he could see was the thick, dusty, tan cobwebs in the dim light. The spiderlings, once covering his face and hands, had disappeared during the fall. Jay tried to sit up, but a stinging pain shot up his leg. Though it was hard to tell, it appeared as though Jay's ankles were shattered. He coughed again, bloody this time, and feeling dazed. A sense of dread swelled up in Jay. The environment around got much colder, much darker, much more foreboding. He tried to drag his broken body away in any direction. He didn't know where, but he knew he had to move. As he clawed through the webs which seemed to be getting thicker and thicker, he felt a tug on his broken ankle. It was ensnared. The pain was immense and Jay gurgled out a yell from a partially blocked throat. Jay tugged again, but he was stuck. Silently, without him even realizing it, his leg had been webbed to the floor. Jay screamed again, trying to be even louder, but his cries were completely muffled. Then he saw Josh's face through the forest. It was pale and sickly. His eyes stared blankly ahead. There was a brief moment of relief, but then Josh's body lurched forward, unnaturally. Jay desperately tried to free himself from the silken feathers because the Josh he saw now was not the Josh he fell down here with. 
Josh's body was covered from the neck down and being clutched by a giant spider leg. Silently, the great eyes of a massive spider came into Jay's focus. Great glossy black orbs piercing Jay's fragile soul. He knew it was too late for him. He should have never challenged Josh to a spider eating contest. Welcome to Steinfield Burger Place. Steinfeld's Burger Palace was a popular joint in my hometown. Sometimes you'd have to reserve a spot a week in advance just to get a table. The diner was known for its famous Henry Burgers, which were named after the owner, Henry Steinfeld. Henry was a very secretive man, always kept to himself and never let anyone into his personal bubble. He was extremely heavy set, well above average height and having some physical deformities. He always stayed in the back so he wouldn't have to talk to anyone. The only time his customers would see him was very late at night when he left the shop or if you asked for him. The first time I met him was the summer after my senior year of high school. I needed a part-time job and saw he was looking for a busboy. One day around lunchtime, I decided to stop by and give Henry my resume. As I walked in, I noticed there were only a few people seated in a booth in the back of the diner, stuffing their faces with burgers about three inches thick, juices running down their chins. After a few minutes, I heard the kitchen double doors open. Very slowly, loud, heavy footsteps came in my direction. Can I help you? I heard the vehement rumble behind me. I turned around as Henry stood there and glared at me. I took a few deep gulps to get my nerve up and handed him my resume. I nervously stood there as he investigated the paper up and down, analyzing it like a police report. You want to work here? He looked down deep into my eyes as he towered over me like a giant. Yes. I realized it was the only statement I could muster up. He stood there for another few minutes, looked at me with his lazy eye, the sweat on my forehead dripped on my white button-down shirt, stains erupted on my armpits as anxiety built. Come in tomorrow, 3 p.m. sharp. He handed me the paper and I watched him as he waddled back to the kitchen. I got there exactly at 3 p.m. the following day. I closed my eyes and took several deep breaths as I opened the door to my new job opportunity. At the counter, I noticed Henry was waiting on my timely arrival. You made it, he said, looking at his watch. His booming voice echoed off the walls like a cathedral. Come with me. I followed him through the double doors. They slammed shut with force, almost knocked me to the ground. The back of the diner was bigger than what I thought. It reminded me of a warehouse, dark and dingy, with overhead lights that flickered like a heartbeat. As I glared around, I tried to take everything in. I ran straight into Henry. I'm sorry. I looked down at the red cement ground, embarrassed by my actions. Here's the kitchen. He motioned all around. This is where I stay. I nodded. Over there, he pointed, is where we keep the meat. There was a silver double door in the back of the kitchen, fastened with a padlock. I have a couple of rules if you're going to work here. I looked up into his eyes, his right one floating slightly out of alignment. Rule one, don't bother me while I'm working. I listened to his every word and watched his every movement. Rule two, that back door right there, he pointed at the two silver doors. Never open those. Keeping the meat clean and cool is the difference between keeping the burgers coming and something going wrong and getting shut down. I understand, I started to say. Rule three, don't bother asking me for the recipe for the burgers. It's a secret and while it's nothing too fancy, keeping it a secret does create a mystery about them that keeps people coming back. He pushed the medium black apron on my chest and motioned for me to go out front. I was greeted by a short, medium-billed, blonde girl. Hi, I'm Cynthia, she said as she smiled. Her teeth glistened like a couple of diamonds in the desert. I'm Tom, I said back nervously. She was a pretty girl, very alluring in appearance. 
not wearing much makeup, only enough to brighten her eyes up. She also had her hair in a cute ponytail that showed off her model-esque jawline and bright blue eyes. And on the nape of her neck, she had a tattoo of a tiny C. So, Tom, I'm going to show you the ropes today. She grabbed her red writing pad. Most of our customers come in around five. That is usually our prime time of serving. Henry told me you're only bussing. Am I correct? That's right, I said back to her. It isn't a hard job, but Henry is very precise of how he wants things done. We headed over to one of the empty tables. I think I already learned that, I laughed at the thought. Don't worry, you'll get used to him and how he runs things, she said as she smiled back at me. She went on to tell me everything that had to be cleaned up by midnight. Henry, before he left the diner, checked everything to make sure it was up to his standard. She showed me the precise way of cleaning off the tables, making sure the floors swept and mopped every night, and the register money had to stay in the safe under the front desk. The night went by pretty fast. I caught on pretty quickly to Henry's strict rules and policies. Even though my boss was a bit strange, I realized I was going to love this job. The atmosphere was great. The customers were warm and friendly, and I enjoyed being around new people. At 11 p.m., everyone scattered like mice on their way to find cheese. I brushed my face off from the sweat that had built up throughout the night. I could feel my cheeks break out with the heat from the exhaustion of the day. How do you feel about everything? Do you have any questions? Cynthia's beautiful blue eyes seemed to shine as she looked at me. I think I have everything, I said back to her, trying to hide my red swollen face. If you have any questions, just remember to ask me in the morning. Have a great night. I watched her through the open window as she walked out of the restaurant to the alleyway. Her ponytail danced along with her slender body. When I grabbed my car keys to leave, I noticed I still had my apron on. I took it off and headed to the kitchen to put it back on the rack. As I opened the doors, I heard a woman's voice around the corner. I immediately stopped everything so I wouldn't be heard. I adjusted my body to see where the voices were coming from. At a slight acute angle, I could see Henry and a big busted brunette woman talking. She was wearing a red crop top, a mini leather skirt, and black high heels. Even being far away, I could see that the mascara was smeared all over her face, giving her a raccoon look. Without meaning to, I held my breath. Towering over her, Henry pressed his hands against her face and brought it up to his. The moment lasted for a few seconds as the woman adjusted her weight, trying to free herself. They both stood there, eyeing each other for what seemed like decades. He reached into his pocket and pulled out some cash. The woman brought out her hand to accept the invitation as he motioned for her to go into the other room with him. Henry pulled off the padlock of the double doors, slightly opened it, and they both disappeared into the darkness. I could finally breathe again. Throwing the apron on the rack, I bolted out of the restaurant. The next day, I intended to tell Cynthia about Henry, the money, and the woman I saw last night, to see what she thought. When I got to the diner, I peeked through the window to see if I could see her, but I only saw a few customers sitting at the counter. The first thing I noticed when I walked through the front doors was Henry limping badly as he walked out of the kitchen. He came straight over to me. Clearly not in a good mood, he said, Cynthia quit, so you'll have to take over. He eyed me as he walked up to the counter. I got it, sir, I nervously said. He limped back into the kitchen and I started helping customers. He pulled out hamburgers left and right mostly the special Henry burgers with the special sauce. My mouth was watering just looking at it. A big beef patty, lettuce, tomato, and a red sauce that everyone said was so addictive. Right before dinner time, when things slowed down a bit, I decided I should try one of these burgers for myself. I asked Henry if he could make me one. He grunted and sent me out on my way as I went on break. I sat down at the very back of the restaurant to have a little bit of privacy. 
I looked at the colossal burger on the plate with its red juices dripping out. It was the biggest burger I had ever seen in my life. So thick that you had to use a knife to cut it into tiny pieces to eat it. After the portions were right, I stuffed one of the sections into my mouth. The delicate red sauce oozed out, dripping on my chin. I made a spot on my white button-up. I quickly grabbed a napkin and cleaned up the stain. I finally understood why this burger was so popular and addicting. Not only was the burger juicy, the red sauce was warm and sweet, which made the taste buds come alive. I closed my eyes and took in every morsel until the dinner bell rang. The rest of the night picked up and then slowed down again. After the diner rush, it was time to start cleaning up to go home. I grabbed the mop and bucket from the closet to clean the red tile that went the length of the whole diner. First, I wanted to clean behind the counter to get any food that may have dropped. I bent down on my knees and scraped hours old sauce that was stuck on the tile. I moved the mop back and forth to make sure I got everything. As I stood up, something caught my attention. Wedged in between the bottom of the counter, there was a square-shaped pen. With a little force, I could get the pen out from the tiny hiding place. As I turned it over, I saw it was Cynthia's name tag. I laid her name tag on the counter and started thinking. Did she have it on yesterday? I know she had it on because I kept looking at it. Suddenly, I heard a loud banging sound that came from the kitchen area. I grabbed the name tag and stuffed it in my pants pocket. I pretended to start mopping as I peeked through the tiny hole that housed the food. Henry came out of the room with the silver doors and quickly locked it behind him. As I watched him, he put the key in a jar adjacent to the room. This is when I knew I had to know what was behind those doors. During training the night before, I remembered Cynthia said that Henry always left at 11.30 every night. Why? I had asked her. No one knows, and I don't want to find out. She'd reluctantly said and moved on to the next task. I rushed to get everything done as the next few hours ticked by like molasses. The adrenaline went through my veins. Inched down from my head to my toes, I played with the salt shakers, pushed them back and forth as I watched the clock. Click. 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 I heard heavy footsteps as the minute hand landed on 11.30. As I peeked through the little window towards the kitchen, I watched Henry as he walked out of his office. His leg dragged behind him, belly bulging out of his white grease-stained t-shirt, and he was holding a large heap of clothing. Right before he got to the back exit, he grabbed a big black trash bag. He ejected saliva on the concrete floor before he exited the building. When the coast was clear, I quickly went through the two doors that led to the back. I knew I only had a little bit of time to explore. I first looked around the room. Everything looked normal to me. The stove was off, but the little light above it was on. As I walked around, the main fluorescent lights flicked, signaling that I needed to hurry. I saw the door to his office, the only wooden object in the whole building. The door squeaked loudly when I opened it, echoing through the room. I turned on the light so I could see the room better. There was nothing but clothes in his room, put in a big pile right in the middle of the floor. I walked over and started looking through it. All the women's clothing. There were t-shirts, pants, skirts, shoes, and the most disturbing yet, underwear. As I moved some of the top pile over, I recognized an outfit. It was something so simple, but it stuck with me. A red crop top, a mini leather skirt, and black high heels. I picked up the red top and examined it. I could still smell the fragrant, flowery perfume. I dropped the shirt, moved back the pile, and left the room. 
When I turned around, the two silver doors called me. I reached up and grabbed the key that was nestled nicely in the jar. When I successfully grabbed it, I slid the key right into the padlock. It fell on the ground, hitting the concrete floor with force. The doors slowly opened up, showing nothing but darkness. The smell filled my nostrils, sweet, heavy, nauseating. I covered my nose and mouth to try to mask the decrepit, vile smell. As I turned on the lights, it flickered for a second trying to gain its heartbeat. At first, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. But as I blinked three times, realizing I wasn't imagining it, on the ceiling there were meat hooks, the ones that hang down from a long metal chain. Normally, butchers use these for pigs and cattle to hang the meat up after they're done skinning the animal, but on these meat hooks were skinned, human body parts. Right in front of me were legs, torsos, arms, moving back and forth on the hooks like dust in the wind. In the corner, the corpses were piled up in disordered mounds, scattered here and there. An immense haunting buzzing filled the air. Thousands of heavy blue flies were hovering over the bodies, the pools of blood, the fecal matter. I wanted to close my eyes or put my hand over my eyes. And at the same time, I wanted to look. To look as much as I could, and by looking, to understand this incomprehensible thing. I heard the chains rattling as one of the swaying torsos caught my attention. I slowly walked over to it, trying not to step on anything. In between the monstrous amount of blood was a remnant of skin. On it was the letter C. I slowly stepped away, inch by inch, towards the door, towards the only exit that would get me out of here. When I neared the doorway, that's when I heard the footsteps, coming right towards me. As I turned, Henry was right behind me, making puddles on the concrete floor, when he looked at me, his lazy eye looked towards his creations, seemingly to smile. Fresh is better, but you've never tasted fresh blood, have you? His scarlet-soaked teeth protruded as he grinned at me. It feels like breathing while drowning, as if your body is about to fall over because your chest is too heavy to carry it. Your eyes are burning and no amount of water can put out the fire. You can't move and every action feels like a chore. Washing your hair becomes hard. You feel disgusting as the dirt builds up in your pores. Life becomes dirty, and you're desperate to feel clean again. This was what it felt like to lose a parent. It was the last thing my mother ever taught me. My mother died four years ago, and I crawled throughout my senior year to deal with it. When I finally got on my own two legs, I moved to Los Angeles for something new. After graduating from college in Connecticut, I needed a fresh start. I found Kayla Wu on a Facebook group for housing sublets in the LA area. Her posting said that she was looking for a roommate to add to the lease. It was 900 monthly with parking and an on-site washer and dryer. It seemed like a good deal. Kayla was short, in shape, with blonde streaks in her sleek black hair. She worked in finance. I envied her as I sat across from her in Starbucks. I wish I had my life together. Where are you from? She asked me. Connecticut, I responded, timidly taking sips from my over-expensive latte. Yourself? She looked up at me and smiled. I'm American, if that's what you're wondering. Oh, I just asked because you asked me, I quickly replied, choking on the liquid. I never thought you weren't American. 
I could feel my face growing hot and red. I hoped it wasn't visible. What do you do for work? I have to make sure the girl that moves in here can pay her dues on time. She said less pleasantly. I just moved here and got a job at Garney's Coffee Shop in North Hollywood. I also have some savings while I look for a better paying job in my field. I looked down at my coffee as I waited for her to answer. So you went to college? Good. Kayla replied. She sniffed her coffee, which was weird, before drinking it. I could see the steam coming out from the top. I know my coffee was searing, which is why it was weird to see her gulping it down. No, not gulping. Slurping. I like you, Olivia. I think you'll be a good fit. Do we have a deal? She stood up and threw her coffee away before putting out her hand. Absolutely. I shook it. My father called me the next day. I told him how I had found housing. He usually calls every two days to check up on me. I felt bad for abandoning him on the East Coast. But I think we both needed space to live, breathe, and to grieve. The next weekend, I moved into my new room. Kayla wasn't home when I got there. She left my key under the doormat. My room was large and I had two big closets. I didn't have that much stuff with me. For the first time in a long time, I didn't think about my mom. I didn't feel everything. I felt normal, like myself again. I ordered a pizza and worked on my laptop until I heard the door open downstairs. Laughter filled the living room. I wiped my hands and went to greet my new roommate. I saw Kayla and some guy with blue hair hugging it out in the kitchen. Great. She has a boyfriend. Not. Hey, Olivia. She said, smiling, as if she wasn't sucking a dude's face right in front of me. I love the room, I said with enthusiasm. It's a big room. Oh, Olivia, this is my friend Mark. Mark, this is my new roommate. Mark put out his hand. I took it. His skin was cold. He was a good-looking guy, but he seemed somewhat out of place with her. I guess not her boyfriend? So Kayla liked to hook up. There were two large bags of food on the ground next to them. We picked up Chinese. Mark grabbed the bags and followed his nightly entertainment upstairs. I'll see you later, Olivia. Let me know if you need anything. Kayla yelled. That night, I lied in my bed, staring at the wall. I couldn't sleep. I heard noises coming from Kayla's room. Great. Here comes the jungle sex. I heard Mark moaning and Kayla screeching. I thought about the last time I had sex. It had been a while. My lady parts throbbed a bit. I felt weirded out that I was so turned on. Then... I heard the shouting. Damn, that must be a really good fuck. Then the shouting turned into screaming. What have I done? Is every night going to be like this? Mark was screaming. It didn't sound like pleasure anymore. I leaned up and walked over to my door, listening through the wood. The guy was literally screaming. Stop it. Please. Please. I heard through the door. What the hell was she doing to him? Then I heard something that I still don't understand. I heard slurping. The way a person slurps when they get to the bottom part of their drink. The way Kayla slurps that coffee at Starbucks. Disgusting. I held my breath and everything went quiet. Kayla's door opened and I quickly went back to my bed. I heard the shower pipe running. It must have been super messy. I was no longer turned on. Honestly, I was mortified. I closed my eyes and forced myself to sleep. This girl was crazy, and my excitement for my new place went away. Instead, I was filled with unease. The next morning, I awoke to the smell of breakfast. I was getting ready for work, so I couldn't talk for long. I showered, picked up my clothes, and headed downstairs. I saw Kayla flipping eggs on the stove. Good morning, she greeted. Good morning, 
I replied as I looked for my box of cereal on top of the fridge. I hope we didn't keep you up last night. I'm sorry if we were loud. I snorted. No, you were fine. I poured my cereal into a bowl and searched for the milk. Would you like some? She offered, pointing to the pan of eggs. No thanks, I responded, feeling awkward. I noticed something on her wrist. A deep scratch mark. Kayla noticed me looking and rolled up her sleeve, the smile fading away. Where's Mark? I asked. He went home already, she said, putting the eggs on a plate. Oh, uh, will you see him again? I questioned as I tied my shoelaces. No, he won't be coming back. Kayla laughed. She took her plate of eggs to the table. He was delicious, if you know what I mean. In the corner of my eye, I saw something scurry underneath the sink. I bent down to take a look. It was a spider. I screamed and grabbed my shoe. Before I could squish it, Kayla was behind me, grabbing the shoe from my hand. What are you doing? She yelled angrily. Move. Kayla picked up the spider with her hand, her bare fucking hand, and put it outside. In this house, we don't kill. We preserve. She said coldly. Sorry, I just hate spiders. Kayla returned to her eggs. They're just misunderstood. I walked out of the house to my car. On my way to work, I noticed a flyer attached to a pole with a young man's face on it. He didn't look older than 20. The flyer stated he had gone missing a month ago. Great. I guess the neighborhood isn't that safe. As I walked into Garney's for my shift, I nervously fixed my apron around my waist. I'd been working here for a month as I stayed on a friend's couch. The shift manager, Alan, was into me. Honestly, I was into him. When the rush died down and we had some free time, I told him about my roommate, Kayla. I told him what I'd heard last night. He thought it was weird, too. Did you see him leave, or him? Alan asked. No. A week later, on a night I was coming back home from my shift, I saw the lights on from the outside. I went to Target earlier to buy some Raid anti-spider spray. I hid it in my bathroom. Just the thought of any of those crawlers on me made me feel sick. As I opened the door, I heard laughing. Kayla was sitting at the table with a guy with red hair and freckles. A new guy already? He even wants to have sex that much. How was work, Olivia? They were eating Indian food. At least she feeds the men she screws. Good, I responded tiredly. I took off my shoes and looked through the cabinet for some soup. This is my friend Zach. Zach got up to shake my hand. I took it and smiled back. Honestly, I was tired and annoyed. It appeared that Kayla's sexual escapades were going to be a normal occurrence, and I wasn't sure that I wanted to live with screams and moans every night, especially the screams that come from these men that sleep with her. It was terrifying. Kayla and Zack whispered to each other and headed upstairs. Good night, Zack said before following after his catch. But who was catching who? That night, I played music on my phone to drown out any sex noises. Everything seemed normal until the screams started. At first, it sounded pleasurable, but then they became animalistic, like a cornered animal trying to run away. Zack's screams became so scary that I got out of bed with my phone ready to call the police. I opened my door, just a crack, nothing but our dark hallway, until Kayla's door opened and Zack ran out screaming for his life. I saw his face. It looked changed, as if his flesh were melting off the bone. What the hell was I even seeing? I couldn't move. I saw his tendons and a piece of bone. Was that his eyeball falling to the floor? <laughs> Help me! Help! Zack screeched, but his words became watery as he collapsed to the ground, turning into a blob of blood purple and blue. I vomited in my mouth. Kayla came out of her room, but she was no longer the woman I met. She had spiky hair all over her skin and a large, engorged tongue that resembled a suction. Fangs! Kayla had fangs! With that tongue, she slurped up all the blood and flesh from the carpet. 
By the end, the fabric was white and perfectly clean. Her skin is going back to normal, and her fangs disappearing back into her mouth. I took a step back, and my floor creaked. Kayla looked at the direction of my room. I quickly closed the door and ran to my bed, pulling the covers over my face. I heard my door open. I heard her footsteps coming towards my bed. After a moment, the footsteps went back towards the hallway. Kayla's door closed. I didn't sleep that night. When the sun rose, I got up and started packing my bags. I was going to sneak out and head back east. Fuck this. I was in danger and all the adrenaline inside me was raging. I had to get out of here, but then something struck me. I had just seen a man get murdered and devoured alive. I understand now that that's what happened to Mark. She ate him. Kayla eats men. If I went back home, I would be safe. But what would happen to all the others who would come here thinking they had scored? The way the flesh melted from his face. I vomited again just thinking about it. No one was going to save me. I had to save myself. But I had to save those men. That's something my mother taught me. A couple of days later, I saw one of my neighbors outside. I walked over to her and introduced myself. Her name was Angela, big-breasted and poorly dyed blonde hair. It's nice to meet you, I said, trying not to gawk at her G-cups. I was curious about the history of this place and my roommate. Do you know what happened to the person that used to live here before me? Angela looked around first, and then leaned closer to me. Don't say anything to your roommate, but you're like the sixth woman to move in here since she took over number 14. Six other people have lived here? Yep, replied Angela. It's funny, I've seen them all move in, but I've never seen them leave. I decided to let it go, to leave quietly without Kayla knowing that I knew her secret, that hopefully I would get out of that house alive with all my belongings. If she ever found out that I knew, what would stop her from finding me? Killing me? Turning me into a blob of flesh and eating me? That night when I came home, she was already sitting in the living room with two young men who looked no older than my age. One of them had a crooked nose and the other had terrible acne. How are you, Olivia? She asked, as if she wasn't a man-eating, slurping, fang-toothed monster. I'm okay. I actually need to talk to you about something. Can it wait until tomorrow? She replied innocently. Sure, I responded. Shall we go upstairs? She gestured to the men. They both glanced at each other in glee. The men disappeared to her room. I watched them, probably and certainly, head towards their agonizing deaths. I could walk away, abandon my things and leave for home. I looked at the front door. So close. I can't let them die. Not like that. I grabbed a knife and headed upstairs to my room. I heard Kayla's bed shaking and I closed my door, waiting, ready for what was to come. Like clockwork, one of the men started screaming. I rushed out of my bedroom with a knife and opened Kayla's door. The man with the crooked nose was sitting in the corner, naked. The acne-filled man was a red blob on her bed. Kayla, fully transformed into her spiky self, glanced at me and grimaced before slurping it up. You're just in time, Olivia. What the fuck are you? I screamed. Kayla's smile disappeared as she slurped up the mushy remains of the man with acne. I'm pretty sure I saw a piece of pimple on the floor. <laughs> what do you mean? I am as human as you. I just have different tastes. She responded, laughing. Yeah, misunderstood? Let him go. Let him go right now. I could feel my legs trying to collapse. Or what? You're going to stab me with a knife? She came towards me, quickly, unnaturally fast, and grabbed the knife. She threw it, 
and it landed perfectly straight into the man with the crooked nose's chest. Why did you have me live here? So you could eat me? I yelled. I don't like women's flesh. The thing is, Olivia, I need you. Or rather, my babies do. Every six months you kill your roommate? Not right away. But once they hatch inside of you, that's usually when it happens. Slowly, painfully, and beautifully. You're part of the process. I tried to run, but she was too quick. She picked me up and threw me across the hallway. I hit the wall. She picked me up and dragged me into my bathroom, and she pushed my head into the toilet. I couldn't breathe. Just let it go, Olivia. You've lost, and I need your body. With my left hand, I grabbed whatever I could reach. The raid bottle. Without thought, I unscrewed the top and dumped it on her. What the fuck? She screeched. Kayla's skin was burning. I threw the rest of it at her face. She screamed. I grabbed the bleach next and dumped that too. Her body started to burn and melt in front of me. But she wasn't melting fast enough. She was about to come for me with her acidic body when the guy with the crooked nose appeared behind her. He pulled the knife out of his chest and stabbed her in the back. Kayla writhed in agony and deserved pain as she became a mesh of flesh. The man with the crooked nose fell and hit the ground, bleeding out. I called 911, but by the time the police arrived, there was a dead man and a pile of melted goop on the floor. I was never charged with the deaths. You see, what Kayla didn't know was that I've been here before. I am a pro at breathing while drowning. My chest has been heavy for years, and I can carry this fucked up moment. My eyes cannot forget the burning of human flesh, or the slurping. But I can envision my future, knowing what I am capable of. Not enough showers can cleanse this blood from my hair. But I no longer feel the need to be clean. Life is dirty.
tales for dark nights.